when I walked in, it was like walking in to the old church over there. <laughs> it was the, the altar looked a lot the same, and I took a picture and I sent it to all my family down here. But it was just, it really is great to be able to take my faith and put it into action into a job that I absolutely love and I'm passionate about. We have a great future ahead of us. We can only grow because it's also amazing to me how generous Catholics are. I've worked for other nonprofit organizations. Never did I see checks come in the mail just to come in the mail. It was usually in response to an ask, to an appeal. But Catholics in Idaho are so generous and we really believe in helping, helping those that are less fortunate. So I know we can only grow. We can grow and we can get better. But we want to plan, have a plan for it. We want sustainable growth. I don't want to come in here and tell Father Ron, guess what, we're going to have counseling in July and not be have a revenue stream to support that next year. I don't want to bring a resource to your community that I'm going to have to take away next year because I can't support it. So we have planned growth, sustainable growth um, as one of our, our goals. We want to connect with the parishes. We want Catholics to understand what Catholic Charities does. We want everyone to, but if Catholics go, and you guys can leave this room and at least have an idea about what we do, then we're, it's going to be impossible for everybody to understand. So we want to connect with our parishes and connect with Catholics, and we've been really focused on that over the next year. I also believe really strongly, because I, again, pay attention to how we use the funds that come into us. Uh, I only want to have programs that have evidence behind it. If we're delivering a parenting class, and it's, we, we should be able to say this curriculum, when a person sits through this class, they will have changed behavior. And there are programs out there for parenting and financial literacy, everything that we do, even types of therapy, evidence out there that says this type of program is gonna change a person's behavior. So that's what we're looking at, making sure that everything that we deliver has evidence behind it. And then creating a foundation for social justice, compassion, and an understanding for those that are just less fortunate. And that is something that compassion is, it's a blessing. And if we all just had compassion for our neighbor and understood the, the plight of low-income people, if we would have, we, our state would be just that much better. So it's, our whole team is very committed to that and helping everyone understand what Catholic Charities does helping everyone build compassion for those that are less fortunate. And with that, I'm gonna breathe. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn it over to, who's going to talk to you about the capital campaign from Guidance and Giving. Dan, I told you Mike. Dan, I didn't know that. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Dan. Number one, talking about the right here. Can you understand it? Yeah, yeah. That's going to be a tough question. I'm from White Cross, Georgia, so uh, I'm from down south. Uh, I'm a Georgia Bulldog, so I want to thank you for allowing a Bulldog coming to Idaho. So, I want to just kind of talk about guys and giving. Uh, Jim Calrola is my uh, compadre tonight. He's going to be talking about the nuts and bolts of capital campaign. But I'm going to talk about guys and giving a little bit what we're going to do, but I want to just kind of back up, kind of tell you how I got involved with guys and giving real quick. I want to tell you, in 1997, I got a phone call from a parish council member that said, hey, Dan, we think you'll be good. We want to nominate you to be uh, on the council. And I just said, what's the easiest way to get out of it? I don't have the time. So they said, all right, Dan, there's no problem. I hung up the phone because I had a business going. I didn't have time to do, deal with it. So as I was walking out one Sunday, I said, well, I dodged another bullet. I don't have to worry with this. The pastor, priest, stopped me. He said, Dan, congratulations. You're on the parish council now. <laughs> I said, Father, you can't do that. You've had all these elections and done that. He said, I can't do that, and you will be on the parish council, and I need your help. And I want to tell you, I think that's where the Holy Spirit has a way of working miracles sometimes, because it's one of these things that I want to tell you. Uh, I thought about it, and I went to my first parish council, and my job was to take care of the maids, the leaky roofs and whatnot. I said, man, this is great. Have a good time. Have a party. Well, little did I know that, as that the next year I moved from another seat to the next year. From that, I moved to another seat because they gave me a gavel, and, was, and I became the president. I figured, oh, now, what's this going to do? So in 1999, our diocese had a diocesan campaign. 
We were in the last phase of the campaign, and I get a phone call from the priest saying, Dan, we need to come down. Someone from the diocese is going to talk to us about a capital campaign. You know what I love, Father? I said, Father, look, I don't do capital campaigns, and I'm not really interested in being involved in this thing. He said, Dan, we don't have a choice. Uh, from the Diocese of Savannah, we're rebuilding the cathedral. We're going to the, to the next, to the year 2000. So we had to get on board. And I come from a little parish of less than 200 families. And so lo and behold, uh, a member of guidance again showed up. I had no idea what these guys did. And with that, I opened my heart, I opened my ears, and I wanted to listen to what could we do. And I, and I kind of started looking back at what has happened in my lifetime and being a part of something of what people have done and looking at what we got to do. And I kind of looked, you know, if I don't do this, who will? So with that, uh, we were able to, there was a very good pair of sharing, but we were able to do something for our church, and we were able to get us something back. And I got up, made a few talks, and a little lo and behold, we made our door. The gentleman from Guys and Gaming said, Dan, you did kind of a good job, but you like coming out trying to do this. Well, I'll tell you, I was involved in my business. My business partners, uh, we voted, we sold our business, so I was without a job. Knights of Columbus wanted me to come sell that insurance. And uh, I wanted to try doing this. Thirteen years later, I'm standing here not going. And I want to tell you, this is the most rewarding job I've ever done. And I want to tell you, we're embarking on something very historic for our diocese here. Uh, as you look here, uh, we're going to be doing something that's going to take a lot of work. Uh, I, last night in the dean meeting, the people looked at me like I was going to do this entire state. Idaho is pretty big. And uh, I'm going to have a staff that's going to help me implement this plan. And what I'm going to tell you, the first thing that we're going to need is people that are willing to go out and help educate people. I don't know how it is in your parish, but from a little parish where I live, down south, people talk a lot. Rumors run rapidly through the parish, sometimes not accurately, but I think it's like anything else. We want to inform the people of Iowa, of this diocese of Boise. And I think it's so important. Uh, I tell you, it's a reception phase. What we're going to do is invite people to come out and hear about the pandemic and give them that opportunity. We're not going to lock the windows and the doors and make people pull out the checkbooks at night. What we're going to do is give them that opportunity to think about it and pray about it. And I think it's so important as we look to the future, to look toward the future needs of this diocese, I think we've got a great opportunity. I have people, this is, I, this is the most traveling year for me I've ever done. And I have people back home saying, but it's tough getting people to give. I don't think it is. I think this is a responsibility that's thrown upon them. All I can do is educate a person and give them that opportunity to be generous. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, I tell you one thing, that's the one thing that the last thing we do in a reception, we're going to have receptions, we're going to talk about it in the pews, and then give people that opportunity to listen why we're moving forward with this. Let me tell you, there's, we're right tonight, there's a reception going on somewhere in America make the diocese better. I think that's as, as a person, I want to leave our world and uh, as a Catholic a little better before we leave. So one thing I'm going to ask you to do is pray for the success of this Catholic campaign. And second of all, be good in that. We're going to have to speak good things about it. And third, we're going to ask you to pray about it and think about it. We'll be sooner than we to when it comes to it. So I think it's so important. Uh, Jill's going to talk about how we got here in this phase. And uh, Ability study, the numbers and things such as that. But uh, I'll tell you, as our responsibility uh, as guys to giving, we're not going to come in and drop a box and say, Father, good luck, we'll see you when this is all done. We're going to help you step by step, working with the volunteers, giving them the tools to implement this plan and give and educate the people. So I think it's so vitally important. As long as people are educated and they know what we're asking them to do. This campaign is spread over a four-year period. We're not asking to do, do it all at one time. We know there's some people that are not going to have, we're not going to even be able to help us in this campaign. But I'll tell you one thing, they can certainly pray for the success of the campaign. It's so vitally important. So this is based on equal sacrifice, not equal giving. So I think it's so important. Some people have been uh, blessed by God and they've been able to bring it back. So I, with that, 
Uh, I want to thank you again for your sacrifice and your time coming out and hearing about this because this is something I can't get back to. So once again, thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm going to turn this over to Jim. Uh, I have my business cards up here. Uh, like I said, the plan, what we do is when we come into the parish, we meet with the pastor, we meet with the leadership. If there's something that we need to change in what we do, we are willing to make that effort. So uh, once again, I want to thank you again for coming out tonight. Thanks, Dan. My name is Jim Calderola, and I'm with Guidance Giving as well. Our firm has been uh, engaged by the diocese. Uh, this is actually our second engagement with the diocese. We began uh, last fall, uh, I think mainly because um, there's a uniqueness about Guidance Giving, and that is all we do, the only work we do is stewardship development, something work in the Catholic region. We only work for Catholic dioceses and Catholic parishes. We don't do hospitals, we don't do shelters, we don't do SPCAs. All we work with is the Catholic community across the United States. And to give you an idea, the company is about 16 years old, I think it is now, or yeah, just about 16 years old. In those 16 years, our firm has worked with between 40 and 50 of the dioceses across the country. Now there's about 195 Roman Catholic dioceses around the country. So we got, we got a little bit of uh, strategic planning to do to get through the end of that process. But one of the things that uh, is most rewarding to us as a company is we're often invited back into the diocese after we've completed the campaign. Uh, parishes bring us back, sometimes we come back and do a second campaign for the diocese. What, that, uh, what we're particularly proud about of that fact is, is that guidance and giving uh, doesn't leave a whole lot of dead bodies behind in the campaign. And there are some organizations, some groups, and you know, some of you might feel like after that after we leave, but uh, we're quite proud of the fact that we do have that reputation of, of uh, talking to people about fundraising in a nice way. And I'll just share a personal story. Uh, Dan talked about how we pr bring people to receptions. About nine, ten months or so ago, was, uh, last uh, early fall, I was in West Virginia. We, we work across the country. And there was a reception going on for a parish campaign. And uh, at the end of the campaign, uh, I was standing by the door. It was in a private residence. This one happened to be a private residence. And people were leaving, and I was speaking to people, and the pastor was, was there. One, uh, actually, two of my colleagues from Guidance and Giving were also there. And a woman came up to me in her West Virginia accent and said, put her hand on my shoulder and said, Honey, I have never been asked for, for money in such a nice way. <laughs> So we do with that part of who we are as a company. Uh, we were hired, I, I think, again, to, to bring this little circle because of our experience in the Catholic community. We were hired by the diocese to, uh, back in the fall, we began in December, we ran through December, uh, January, and a little bit of February. Myself and uh, several of my colleagues spent that time, uh, not you know all of it at one time, but we spent many weeks there, many days there, traveling to every parish in the diocese of Boise. So personally, I had a couple of weeks up north when we got to Port Wayne. And I had one week where it was just absolutely beautiful fall colors, and I had one week where everything was white. So um, driving to St. Mary's, is that where it is? In the middle of a snowstorm with a crappy little riding car. Would recommend it. <laughs> But what we did is we visited every single pastor except one. We just couldn't get one pastor to make uh, uh, our schedules work together. We interviewed um, another 40 to 50 individuals selectively around the diocese. And so well over 100 people were interviewed. But um, every pastor, a good number of clergy, uh, some of the younger priests, some of the retired priests, and as I say, every pastor except one, and a good number of lay people. We also did a survey, you might recall, uh, it was around the end of January, first part of February. We didn't mail it. What we did is we distributed it through all the parishes, and then some pastors were more uh, vocal about encouraging their parishioners to participate. Some were less vocal. Uh, it was also on, on the DOS website for people to participate on, and we had about uh, several hundred, just short of several hundred uh, surveys came back. What we found in that study is that there was indeed a strong level of support among the clergy and laity that were surveyed and those that we interviewed that the diocese was in a good position to go forward. Now that's not to say there weren't any concerns, because there certainly were. 
different parts of, of the diocese, different parts of the state are experiencing different economic situations. Uh, different uh, parishes are in different situations than some others. So I'm not going to tell you to stand here and pretend that you know universally everybody said, yeah, let's jump into this pool together. Uh, but generally people said, we should go forward. So we made those presentations to the bishop and a group of his advisors. Um, and the bishop made the decision to go forward. And so that's why we're here tonight. We've begun the process of education, as Dan talked about. Our whole company uh, bases its, its, its methods and its reputation on being good communicators. We want to get out the message of why Bishop Bristol, why the diocese is moving forward. And I think Chuck has laid the groundwork perfectly. As we're going to talk a little bit about the campaign goal, which is uh, for this campaign, um, there we go, $15 million. And we didn't just pluck that number out of the air. It's our experience that a diocese can do in a campaign like this for causes similar to this, uh, roughly one time the collective offertory of all the parishes. You heard Chuck say that last year, collectively, roughly the, the Sunday offertory, uh, you know, there's 52 weeks, 52 collections, and sometimes Christmas doesn't fall on a Sunday, and pastors just love that because there's 53 collections that year. Well, based on the 52 collections, and maybe Christmas is thrown in, sometimes not thrown in, you're running around $14 million. In our experience, uh, as a company, as we work with these 40 some odd dioceses around the country over the years, so you can do about one times your offertory. So there's $14 million. And then Bishop Bristol, in the course of our interviews, as we were doing the surveys, as we were doing the interviews, we discovered there's quite a potential, there's at least some potential for some major gifts, some significant gifts of 50,000, 20,000, 100,000, maybe even on up. Bishop Bristol has made a personal commitment to work with us, particularly me, that's going to be my part of the, of the campaign, to um, approach individuals about making significant gifts, and that's how we've kicked it up to $15 million. And so as you talked, uh, as Chuck talked about what the projected needs are over the years, you're going to see that what we're going to be raising funds for, you have this as a handout in, in uh, folded into that newsprint that you have there, is uh, one million dollars will go to that special care fund for priests. Because sometimes it's not just the retirement money that, that the priests need to take care of themselves, but it's also these extraordinary medical expenses, don't it holds, you know, who knows what's gonna happen with the Supreme Court ruling tomorrow, but uh, there's all kinds of questions about that. And I think it's really prudent on the part of, of the CFO and, and Chuck and the Bishop and the Finance Council of the Diocese to begin projecting out what it's going to cost and then to begin looking at how do we fund ourselves, how do we prepare ourselves for the future for those potential costs out there. So there's a million dollars of the 15 is going to go for the care of priests. Chuck did the projection on the seminarians. The good news is you got four more seminarians this fall. The bad news is you got four more seminarians this fall. You got to pay for it. And so if, if the goal is to more than double that to 20 in, in the next several years, there's got to be some sort of resource that you can begin drawing off of. And so there's already an existing endowment in the foundation for seminary education. This will be added to that a million dollars. In addition, some of that money will also be used to continue education for clergy. Uh, God knows that uh, once the bishop lays hands on you guys, that's not the end of your education you Right? Right. Okay. Um, there's also about $3 million for Catholic education, and that's broken down uh, to a $2 million uh, endowment for Catholic school scholarships to be administered across the diocese, high school, of course, Bishop Kelly, and then also the grade schools. Also, grants made available for uh, religious education to parish programs and that. And then a, a specifically, a $1 million is going to be set aside and this is money that would not be you put in an endowment. This is more immediate needs to make physical improvements on the three campus Catholic centers that are in Boise State, help me here, please. Idaho State and University of Idaho. The University of Idaho. Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, go Big Red. Big <laughs> Red. You're done talking. I know. I did that. All right, I quickly turned this into the gutter, didn't I? Yeah, I just stepped in at this time. I just stepped in. Anyway, between campuses. The other day, too. Let's 
talk about let's talk about the campus ministry programs. Um, a million bucks of the three for education will be used to make physical improvements, and apparently uh, some of them are pretty poor. You probably have seen them. I haven't seen them myself, but. Uh, and then some of the money is going to be used for specific programs. So there's $3 million in Catholic education. There's also um, $2 million for the social teachings of the church that uh, Landis spoke so eloquently about. A million dollars will be set aside in endowment to, get, to make grants to community and parish programs like St. Vincent de Paul or your uh, noticed um, a food bank right behind you here. Uh, we we're trying to figure out the parking lot that you so messed up today. <laughs> anyway, um, that money will be made available to support the ongoing uh, work of parishes and other Catholic organizations throughout the diocese. And a million dollars will be set aside in, in the foundation uh, as an endowment for the future growth and expansion and use by Catholic charities. Of Idaho. So there's a $2 million component there. Um, what we've suggested and what's been accepted, what we generally uh, accept is that, uh, generally recommend, is that during the course of the campaign, which is roughly going to be 12 months, Dan is actually moving to Idaho beginning July 16th. And uh, we'll be looking for a place to rent out of Boise. He's going to drive his car up from uh, Savannah, Georgia. And he'll be joined by one and later on additional staff. Uh, I uh, and, and uh, two or three others of our team will be flying in and out, just bothering Dan for a week or so before we fly off to the next place, wherever that might be. So um, we're doing some setup. There are three of us right now in the diocese. And uh, we're helping Dan get things rolling and set up. And Dan is actually going to be physically locating with his team here in Idaho. And we will be working with every parish over the course of 12 months. Now, uh, in that 12-month period, your normal Idaho Catholic appeal for 213 will fall. And what we're saying is suspended for the year. And so 2.5 million of the 15 will go toward the Idaho Catholic appeal for 2013, which is day-to-day -day operations as opposed to the endowment, future growth funds that we're talking about through the regular campaign. And then what we've uh, suggested, when we were out there doing the feasibility study, we asked the pastors and a number of lay people, and as you can imagine, the pastors were a little more adamant than the lay people about how much of each dollar raised should stay at the parish for local parish projects. And we were testing, our normal test is 80% goes to the diocese, 20% goes to the parish, or 75, 25. We were testing those numbers. And when we came back and we explained what we found to Bishop and to the, the various groups of whose bureau council, what have you, the decision was made that 60% will go to the diocese. 40% of the dollars raised above and beyond the Catholic appeal will stay here at parishes. Additionally, once a goal is set, and I'll talk about how we do that in a moment, once the goal is set, it flips 75% of the dollars raised in the parish will stay at the parish. So the bishop recognized, as we brought back the information from our travels around the diocese, that indeed, this campaign would be an opportunity not just for the diocese to grow, but also to assist the parishes, many of which um, have their own special needs, whether it's future building or paying for existing building or whatever project you might have in mind. And so uh, the 5 million of the 15 is what we've projected if 40% of the 15 will stay at the parishes. So, uh, and then there's a final component, which is uh, uh, initial, initially some of the costs uh, of the campaign itself. There's a video, there's brochures, uh, there's mailings, there's our firm speed, and what have you. So that makes up the goal. Now, what we're going to do, uh, Dan and, and the team will be meeting, we'll be sending out actually a pastor's packet to every parish, uh, we hope by next Friday, and it'll have a preparation memo. And one of the things we're going to do is suggest that every parish set a minimum goal of one times your offertory. So if your offertory in a parish is, just for the sake of conversation, a half a million dollars, the goal in that parish would be half a million dollars. And now what we've done is we've also formed a pastoral advisory council made up of several priests. Father Ron is one of those. And that group will help us determine what and when uh, a pastor 
parish council brings forward to us, to the bishop, that their goal is too high or their goal is too low, do you think that might happen? Um, that pastor advisory council will weigh in, and it's not going to be our company, it's not going to be the bishop, it's going to be a uh, coordinated, cooperative effort of a number of, of, of priests <coughs> represented from around the deaneries, around the state, with our company experience, saying to Father, yeah, you're right, your goal is too low, we ought to raise it up by a couple hundred grand. Or, you know, whatever the particular circumstances are. So that's how we'll set the goals for the parishes. Now, uh, there's also a couple of campaign options. And that's also explained uh, in detail, and I won't go into the various levels of detail. But what we would ask every single parish to do is to pick one of these. And this is going to be an early process. This is part of the preparation process. What we're going to ask is go to option one on the menu or option two on the menu. Option one on the menu is a good faith effort. That is, and that's sort of explained there, that we lay out a program. We've done this many times before. We've done it with many parishes, many dioceses. We know the kind of steps. We know how to do the education process. We know how to bring people together to build a community of faith as they share their time, their talent, and their treasure. So if you follow these steps, you make a good faith effort, and you don't meet your goal, that's it. It's a goal. It's nothing. It's not a tax. It's not an assessment. It's simply a goal. It's a target. Option two would be for those parishes that have extraordinary needs, whether they're in the midst of their own building campaign, or they have extraordinary debt, or they, uh, basically those are the two reasons. What we would suggest at that point is the goal would be a guarantee. Once the ICA goal for 2013 is met, 60% because of the 60-40 split of everything that would be raised up to the goal would go to the diocese. 100% after that would go into the extraordinary funds or the extraordinary need that the parish would have. And there's the conditions that you can see there. There'd be some extra council time that would be needed, costs and so forth and so on would be worn more by the parish than by the diocese. So we will be sitting down and talking with every pastor and every parish trying to figure out with them which would be the best option. If you flip that page over, you'll see some uh, scenarios on how the numbers would bang out. And we don't need to go through any of that, unless you want to afterward. Uh, I'm happy either Dan, of course Dan is happy to stand here and talk about that. What we're gonna do is break the parishes up. As I said, we're gonna be here for 12 months on site in the diocese, our staff will be. And what we're gonna do is break up the parishes into blocks. And we're going to work our way through the parishes in a parish campaign. See, the Dawson campaign is nothing but a whole series of parish campaigns that build upon each other. We're going to work each block and each parish and each block for, depending on the size of the parish and the number of parishioners, 10 weeks to maybe 16 weeks. We're done with them and we move off to the next parish to finish all those parishes in the block, then we move off to the next block. There'll be two blocks, one in the fall and one in the spring. Very simple. You know, we said this once in a presentation um, in a parish in Houston, Texas. We said, you know, this is not rocket science. And the guys in the room, people in the room, not just the guys said, well, you know, we are rocket scientists. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, that's, those are the nuts and bolts of the campaign. What I want to assure you, or, or uh, re-emphasize with you is that we will not come in, as Dan said, leave a box on the pastor's table and say, okay, uh, call us when you hit the goal. That's not how we work. You will have on-site counsel in each and every parish as we work our way through the 50-some-odd parishes, all the missions and uh, uh, stations as well until we get to the goal. If we uh, get to 15 million in the block one, and don't think we're going to not do block two, because we're going to raise as much money as we can raise while we're here in the diocese to help you grow. I think that's the end of... Another slide? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just think for, for being so kind and patient, and we want to be very respectful of your time, too, because we said that the meeting time is Saturday and Thursday. And so I'd like to open it up for questions, and then we'll end, you know, around 8.30. Private if you like. 
But also, I just wanted to mention just one more thing if we're closing. Just, this is an opportunity for the diocese to really springboard into our communities and to reach out and to have a conversation, ongoing conversation about the needs of the church and build our faith in Idaho. I see, I mean, I'm new to the diocese, but I'm, I'm really excited about this opportunity to work with Landis, with Catholic Charities, with all of the different departments at the diocese and just be present in all of our parishes and talk about the needs and listen to what's happening in different areas because we're all very different. I've spent, I've already done two trips to all of the deaneries and I've enjoyed every minute of it, just learning about the different needs in the different communities and everyone is special in their own way and they have different challenges and I've just been listening to hearing what's been going on and the diocese is here to help and to assist and to, you know, just be open to whatever needs to be done. We're in this together to make this campaign a success for the future and also just to build our faith, like I said, in Idaho. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you and just being present and I'm always available as well. But I'd like to just open it up for questions and for any of us that have spoken tonight. So who's first? It's going to take a lot of work, and it's going to take a lot of people with a lot of hard work 
that we feel that it can be successful. There's going to be a, uh, a board of directors handling this major campaign funds. Are there, are there going to be as many people from Magic Valley on that board as there are on the Captain uh, no, Charities Board? We are, we are taking for charity, and right now the position is considered equal for each charity. We have no less than nine people and no more than ten five. Right now, we have about nine people that have shown an interest that we would like to serve, and it will be regional, and we are having those votes. On Captain Charities Board, We have two openings on the board. Uh, are you we'll love to get some residents. Yes, um, we are the finance city out for
Yeah. One question that hasn't been asked is, uh, what about the large Hispanic community in this part of Idaho? And uh, uh, interesting, has been asked that. But I'll, I'll, give, I'll ask Jim. What about the Hispanic community? Okay, here's the answer. The answer is uh, all of the materials we're doing, including the video, will be bilingual. Uh, we have bilingual staff, and they will be assigned only those Spanish-speaking parishes, the majority parishes, so off to the second block that's in the spring coming through 2013. Um, and Dan will be joined with Spanish-speaking people on our, on our team uh, to do those parishes. And it might be just a reception in a parish, or it might be the whole parish has to be done in Spanish. And we're going to evaluate that as we continue our preparation. Well prepared to do uh, Spanish speaking games <coughs> as well as English speaking games. So, looking at this, we have um, there's no uh, there will be no other since fundraising, we can't do any other fundraising things in there, so we're looking at doing a kitchen project. Well, it's only going to be 25, maybe 35 to be completed doing the bathroom. So that would be a perfect, perfect case for your share of the, the 40% and then the 75% above that. So what we don't want you to do, Father, is to run a campaign while we're doing the DOS campaign. You know, so I understand that. So, right. that's 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 so in this, help me understand how number one works. Okay, number one. Right, right. So in, a, in my situation, explain how do I, how would I promote that? When would we be able to begin this project? Do I have to wait three, four years before we do the kitchen, or help me, help me understand? This. Okay, we're going to we're going to do active campaigning in the parish within the next twelve months. Right. Okay. You might be in block one, which is this fall. You might be in block two, which is in the spring. Okay. Only two blocks. So what we're going to do? Let's say your offertory is a half a million dollars a year. No, my offertory is about a hundred and. Let's think big. <laughs> Look, I want to, and this would be better for me to go exactly to, to my What's your auditory? What? 20? All right, let's just round numbers because okay, okay, I'm not a rocket scientist. Sure. 100 grand a year. Okay. All right. So what's your ICA goal? Good question. That's why the ICA is not meeting goal. Well, we made it for What was our ICA goal? Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Your yeah. parish is about 30,000. Can we round numbers off? I'm just all right, your goal is $130,000 for the campaign. On your off target 30, I see. Total over the three years. Four years. Over four years. years. Yeah, over the four years. So we're going to, the answer to come in with this team, one of our teams would be there, work with your father, work with your leadership committee. We're going to set a goal of $130,000 to your parish. First 30 grand in, in that 10 weeks that our staff is working with you there on site. First 30 grand in goes to the ICA. That's guaranteed. Okay. Now the next hundred comes in the door, it's a 60-40 split. 60% 60 goes, 60,000 goes to the diocese, you got 40. So you meet goal, you have $40,000. How much is your kitchen project? 25. You can do two kitchen projects. And then anything above the 130, you keep 75% if the diocese has 25%. Now what we do is ask you to make a pledge over a four year period. Ask you to now pay attention to make your pledge over four years. Quite frankly, less than half make pledges. So the majority of the cash comes in the door right away. And all the process by the diocese. And as the cash comes in on a periodic basis that's still being determined how and when by Chuck, you'll get a check for your share of 60, 40, 75, 25. At the end of the four year period, the, the pledge redemption, the gift redemption process will be managed by the diocese. Usually we get about 95, 96% redemption. You know, sometimes something you said, something you didn't say, something the bishop said, something the bishop didn't say, some people are going to change, jobs, you know, die, whatever. You don't get 100%, you never get 100%, but we're running 95, 96, it's coming nationally. So at the end of the day, you're going to see 95% of the gifts come in the door, and you're going to get 60% up to 130, and you get 75% every year. And you can see that the cash flow will start out real high, Year one, drop a little bit in year two, year three, year four. And that's not it's about the active campaign in your parish is 10, 12, 15 weeks on the outside of the parish. It sounds like you don't have a very large parish. So maybe eight, ten weeks, something like that. Okay. And we're sitting down one on one with you explain that. Parishioner, or our 